Hello everybody, my name is Dariusz Kulus, I'm from the UTP University of Science and Technology in Bydgoszcz, Poland, and today I would like to tell you a few words about cryopreservation of bleeding hearts. So bleeding heart is a popular ornamental perennial plant species originating from Asia, but today it can be found in homes and gardens and parks and practically all over the world due to the exceptional beauty of, of its flowers. But besides the uh, ornamental value, uh, this plant species has also numerous other applications. For example, it can be a source of valuable alkaloids such as isoquinolines or berberine, uh, which can be used uh, in, in medicine, for example, in treatment of uh, depression. Uh, it is also used in folk medicine for the treatment of inflammations uh, or pus. Uh, it is also used in dermatology and cosmetology as the extracts obtained from, from this plant uh, prevent the aging of skin. Uh, and it is also a source of valuable antibacterial and antifungal anti metabolites, uh, which can also um, have a practical use. Uh, besides that, the plant is a source of some biological active lactones, which are quite uh, effective in uh, cancer treatment, for example. Uh, and furthermore, the plant uh, is a source of resistance genes, uh, especially genes uh, of uh, resistance towards low temperature stress. Uh, and due to this uh, undeniable potential of, uh, of bleeding heart, uh, the plant should be introduced to laboratories uh, and to in vitro tissue culture systems, uh, which could be used uh, either for the reproduction purposes, for the storage and protection, and also for breeding aims. However, despite the uh, great importance uh, of, uh, of, those spe of this species, so far, only limited information on in vitro tissue culture uh, in this plant exists. Uh, and therefore, the aim of this study was to optimize and evaluate the effectiveness of vitrification, droplet vitrification and encapsulation vitrification techniques on cryopreservation of bleeding heart cultivar gold heart. The biological material which was used in this study were shoot tips. To produce those shoot tips, the nodal segments were cultured on the Murashige and Skook medium supplemented with kinetin, abscisic acid, and with an uh, increased uh, concentration of sucrose for seven days. Uh, and uh, after this preculture period, shoot tips were produced. They were about one, two, millimeters long, and those uh, shoot tips were subjected to three cryopreservation techniques. In the first vitrification technique, the shoot tips were first osmoprotected in the loading solution, the most common one, uh, and then they were dehydrated with the plant vitrification solution 3 for, uh, from 0 to 180 minutes with, with a 30 minute interval. And after that, uh, the dehydrated, the pretreated shoot tips were placed in, in sterile cryovials uh, and immersed in liquid nitrogen. In the second technique, in the droplet vitrification technique, a similar approach was used, except that after the uh, pretreatment step, the shoot tips were placed on aluminium foil strips uh, in a drop of the plant vitrification solution mm. and then they were immersed directly in, in liquid nitrogen before they were uh, placed in, in a cryovial. In the last technique, in the encapsulation vitrification technique, the shoot tips were first encapsulated in 3% calcium alginate uh, and after the encapsulation again they were osmoprotected and dehydrated just as previously described. The samples were stored in liquid nitrogen for at least one hour, and in order to recover them, uh, they were rewarmed in a water bath at 38 degrees for three minutes. Uh, the plant vitrification solution was washed with, with a liquid 
uh, Murashige and Skog medium with an increased sucrose concentration uh, for, for 20 minutes. And then the rewarmed shoot tips were placed on the recovery media. Uh, this was the Murashige and Skog medium with the addition of, uh, of benzo adenine. Uh, and the plants were cultured for, for two months. And after that period, the recovered uh, plants were subjected to a quite extensive uh, stability analysis. Uh, so in order to evaluate the effectiveness of, uh, of those tree cryopreservation technique, of course, the recovery level was, was measured, uh, the, the share of explants that were able to, to form shoots, uh, the morphology, the biometric, uh, parameters of uh, of the plants were analyzed. Uh, also, the plants were uh, subjected to a molecular analysis. Three um, molecular markers were used, RAPD, ISSR, and SCOTS. And finally, the plants were also subjected to a biochemical analysis. The content of chlorophylls and anthocyanins uh, in the plants was also measured. So, it was found that uh, the uh, cryopreservation technique the, and the duration of dehydration affected uh, both the recovery and also the morphology of, uh, of the plants. The highest recovery uh, was found in the untreated controls, uh, non-encapsulated and not dehydrated uh, or only treated with loading solution. Here, full 100% recovery was found. Uh, other treatments led to a decrease of, of this parameter. As for the, um, uh, from, as for the cryopreservation recovered um, plants, the highest recovery rate was found with the encapsulation vitrification technique. It was over 73%. Uh, the job identification technique was a little bit less successful, although still over 50% of explants were able to, to survive. The vitrification technique was the least effective. Uh, as you can see here in, in the first part of this table, with the encapsulation protocol, longer dehydration was needed to obtain high recovery, which is probably due to the presence of the of the matrix, uh, so a longer dehydration is, is needed. With the uh, vitrification and droplet vitrification techniques, shorter dehydration times were more effective. Uh, as for the vitrification and especially droplet vitrification technique, perhaps using a different plant vitrification solution, for example, PVS2, would be uh, a little bit more successful. It is also worth mentioning uh, that the encapsulation vitrification technique was superior in terms of, uh, of shoot proliferation because four to even five new shoots from a single uh, shoot tip could be produced. That was uh, significantly more compared with the untreated control. Uh, on the other hand, the longest shoots and of greatest fresh wave were obtained with the vitrification technique. This is possibly due to easier gas exchange in the non-encapsulated explants, or on the other hand, uh, this could be a result of hyperhydration of, uh, of the shoots, uh, since this, uh, this the vitrification technique was the least effective, so this is also possible. Uh, encapsulation uh, also positively affected the rooting of shoots. Uh, uh, about 40% of, of shoots were uh, able to, to form um, roots in, in this technique, which is much more compared to the control, where none of the, of the shoots formed roots spontaneously. As for the biochemical analysis uh, and the content of chlorophyll, uh, it is worth mentioning that the highest content of chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and total chlorophyll was generally observed in the untreated control. Uh, all other treatments uh, generally had a negative 
impact on, on this parameter, which is actually quite common because chlorophyll is quite a labile uh, pigment, so, so stress may cause uh, the degradation of, of this metabolite. Uh, a quite different situation was observed with anthocyanins. Uh, it was found that cryopreservation affected uh, the content of those metabolites, and with the droplet vitrification and vitrification technique, uh, it was sometimes observed that the content of anthocyanins was higher compared to the untreated control, and those shoots were in fact more red uh, if you look at them. Uh, but, on the other hand, the longest dehydration time and the longest PVS3 treatment resulted in a decrease uh, in the concentration of, of those pigments. In this study, also, uh, and, uh, the strength of association between the analyzed traits was observed. So, uh, in this table, you can see the results of Pearson correlation coefficient. The red font uh, is related to the untreated control, and the blue, fo the blue font uh, is, uh, is related to, to the cryopreservation-derived plant material. So, for example, you can see that in the uh, non-cryopreserved uh, plants, there was a positive uh, correlation between the recovery rate uh, and, for example, the rooting rate or chlorophyll A and B contents. And, for example, in the cryopreservation-derived plant material, uh, the number of shoots produced by a single explant was positively correlated with the shoot length, shoot wave, and rooting rate. But what, uh, what is really interesting about this table is uh, that you can see here that sometimes uh, the correlation was completely different depending if the material was or wasn't stored in liquid nitrogen. For example, you can see that uh, with the non-cryopreserved control, there was a po uh, positive correlation between the recovery rate and the content of chlorophyll B. And in the cryopreservation derived plant material, there was a negative correlation between those two traits. And similarly, uh, also, the content of chlorophyll B and anthocyanins was positively correlated in the non ln treated samples, while a negative correlation was found in the cryopreservation-derived samples. So this could uh, suggest that low temperatures and uh, storage in liquid nitrogen per se uh, affect uh, the quality of the plant material. As for the molecular analysis of, of genetic stability, two out of three uh, markers were able to detect uh, some minor variation. Uh, ISSRs and RAPDs were, were able to detect some small mutations in, in a total of four plants uh, tested. So the RAPD markers detected one polymorphic plant uh, which uh, was derived from the vitrification technique based on 150 minute dehydration with PVS3. On the other hand, ISSR had uh, a, a bigger uh, discrimination power. Uh, they detected three polymorphic plants, one from the vitrification technique, one from the droplet vitrification technique, uh, and one from the untreated control. But like I said, those mutations were quite small, uh, and the uh, AMOVA analysis of, of molecular variants uh, um, revealed that only 2 to 3 uh, percent of the total variation uh, between the, within the, the plant material uh, was actually related to, to cryopreservation. So, to summarize, uh, this is the first report on the successful cryopreservation of Lamprocapnos spectabilis. Among the three uh, techniques evaluated, encapsulation vitrification was the most effective, while the vitrification technique the least. But this is very often a, a plant species matter. 
The encapsulation vitrification protocol was the most successful in securing the viability of the explants and in stimulating their morphogenetic response. I mean the shoot proliferation and the root formation. And this technique was also the only one that did not impose extra mutational load on the plants. The other two techniques uh, were the source of some minor uh, mutations. Uh, cryopreservation also caused a significant decline in chlorophyll content compared to the untreated control. It also affected the concentration of anthocyanins in plants, either increasing or decreasing their level depending on the dehydration time. And to summarize, the optimized encapsulation vitrification protocol based on 150 minute dehydration with PVS3 can be recommended for the long-term storage of genetic resources of Lanthrocapna spectabilis goldheart with possible extension to other cultivars or even plant species. If you would like to know more a little bit uh, about this, uh, this research, uh, I invite you to read my article, which was published recently related to, to cryopreservation of uh, Lanthrocapnos spectabilis. Uh, and, of course, if you have any questions, I am always happy to, to, to cooperate and to answer them. Uh, so please don't hesitate to, to send me an email with, with some questions. And thank you very much for your attention.